All right, let's see if I can get through this. I, uh, I was sick earlier in the week and I got over it, but now I have this, this really nasty cough. So uh, <clears throat> I saved my special cough drop just for this. And um, let's, uh, let's get this going. So welcome, everyone. Um, and actually, I, I'd like to point out that um, it, it, there's a bit of a nostalgia here that we have uh, Tony in the audience tonight, who was actually our first speaker when we, uh, when we kicked this off uh, just over two years ago. So uh, you must have done something right, Tony, because we're, we're still here today. So uh, we're, we're honored to uh, have you back. But, um, yeah. So um, we are the, uh, the Santa Clara Valley Ch uh, Pels chapter. And uh, this is our, our main bragging point. Last year, we, uh, we did something that's never been done in the history of IEEE, as far as anyone still can't tell me otherwise. Um, where we won the best champion for the um, local, the local level, the section, um, the national level for our, uh, our region six, um, and the whole society worldwide, and uh, no one has done uh, one all three of those at the same time uh, uh, before. Again, far far as I can tell, no one tell me otherwise, um, and uh, and we're proud of that. Not just as a bragging point, because uh, it speaks to um, you know the caliber of speakers that we have. Uh, and uh, and our membership, and uh, that that people seem to get something out of it, and uh, that's what matters most to us. That's why we do it. So thank you all. Yeah, we rock. All right. Um, <clears throat> this is why you're here tonight. Uh, hopefully, this doesn't come as a surprise to you. And uh, we'll be uh, talking about Earl a little more in a minute. But, uh, we are uh, happy to have him giving a talk tonight. This extremely busy slide. Uh, you can just look at it and memorize it yourself. Okay, that should be good. Um, no, but uh, we're actually, uh, this is a, a really special event we're going to have next month in lieu of our monthly meeting. Um, this is a full day tutorial. And um, this isn't, this is uh, co-sponsored by the, the official uh, IEEE 5G initiative. And, uh, and what this is, this isn't just another 5G event. This isn't talking about spectrum. This isn't talking about marketing projections about, you know, billions or trillions of devices and, 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 um, all, all these cute things, um, it's going to address the untold story of, uh, of 5G, which is this, this major power gap um, that when you do the math, uh, especially for all these end nodes and all these little tiny devices that uh, are supposed to be uh, you know, on this massive network, um, that there really doesn't exist uh, enough power in the world today to uh, supply uh, all, all, those, all those exponential marketing projections. So, um, I don't know, hopefully you can see it, um, that, you know, we have just, just seven speakers, um, and it's all, they're all very high quality speakers, it's a mixture of kind of covering from network level stuff to, you know, base stations to at the edge to devices, and even if you have nothing to do with telco or, uh, or network power, this really touches just about everyone, because you're involved in smaller devices, IoT, wearables, um, industrial automation, um, AR, VR, uh, autonomous vehicles, everything that goes with it, um, this has a direct impact on you. And this is, uh, this, this is information and telling the story about this that you really don't see um, anywhere else. And we brought it all together in one spot. This will be a very special event, and I promise you will get a lot out of it. So I really encourage you to come and, uh, and tell your, your friends and colleagues about it as well. Uh, there's flyers for it on the table there in front, too. If you like the old-fashioned way, or, or come to our, uh, our website. <clears throat> and since we're doing that uh, in lieu of our monthly event, well, then why not just uh, have a good old social event? So um, we're announcing this here uh, that in our normal slot of the fourth Thursday of the month, um, it'll be uh, something, oops, co-sponsoring with uh, the Pell's YP Young Professionals and Women in Engineering. Um, so it'll probably be held at uh, Lily Max in uh, Sunnyvale. That's where it's been before. But this is just a straight up, just show up and talk and eat and drink and enjoy. Uh, it's just a token of our appreciation for our membership. So uh, stuff, information will be sent out to the membership about this shortly. Uh, we want to thank our IEEE co-sponsors for tonight's event. The, uh, the Communication Society, ComSoc, and um, MP, uh, who's uh, actually the chair of ComSoc, is here tonight, he said, oh, there he is right there. So he, he's uh, wearing his, his other hat too, since he's a uh, member at large, a former vice chair of uh, this very Pell Society. 
for the group. And then this is also co-sponsored by the Microenthering Technique Society, uh, run by Oren Laney. Uh, he was sorry he's out of town, couldn't make it tonight. And uh, we do want to also give a special thanks to our venue sponsor, TI, who provides this great room and fantastic um, AV support, and uh, which has. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Simon, our, our sponsor here, and, and Jeff, our, re our retired former sponsor, who strong armed Simon or suckered or whatever you want to call him into it. But we, we thank them very much, and I think they actually deserve a round of applause because. Um, yeah. <clears throat> That really is the key to making this all happen. Uh, if we didn't have the venue, uh, make makes a huge difference our ability to put on these um, types of events for you. This is the uh, the crew in Pels here, the <coughs> XCOM that makes it happen. Um, for those in the room, please stand up. You know who you are. So um, these are the people that work hard to put all these events together. Um, not only the events, but when you stand, you know, the website and the, the recordings and. Um, and anything else, um, it's, it's, it's a hard-working crew, and um, yeah, they should be recognized for it. Um, so this is something tonight, we have a, a feature we call Power Sources, where uh, we try and uh, just take a minute to uh, identify some, uh, some key resource, you know, uh, and tonight, in the case tonight, it's a, a text. Sometimes, you know, maybe it's a, a calculator or some online tool, or just some kind of little tidbit that uh, might uh, help you, or something you wish you knew about, a long time ago that might help you in your everyday work. And uh, so tonight that's going to be uh, presented by Doug. It's supposed to be two minutes or three minutes. I feel like I'm in third grade giving a book report. <coughs> Sorry. I know it seems like every month I seem to do it. If anybody else uh, has something good they'd like to present, go ahead. So I try to buy every power electronics book I can, and there's only about maybe ten magnetics, uh, power magnetics book, textbooks or books, and this is one of them. So I bought this years ago, so I haven't, I, have, I probably read it more than ten years ago. But I have the first edition and the second edition. It's a really good book on magnetics. So all the magnetics books are uh, fairly similar. They give the same type of theory and magnetic stuff. This does the same. Uh, and then they go through. There's a few different ways to design type power magnetics. So this is high frequency magnetics, not power lines, 60 hertz stuff. Although there is 60 hertz stuff in here. Uh, but this is more of the 100 kilohertz and above type of high frequency magnetics. But the good thing about this book is it actually um, it's much more practical, and it talks about a lot of the um, not so much as design and design equations, but more about all the practical stuff for insulation and uh, core area and all those other types of things like that. But a very practical book uh, for uh, for designing a power magnetic. So it's a really good, uh, useful book to keep in your library and skim through it once in a while to get a uh, background on magnetics. I'll keep it on the table if anybody wants to take a look. Thanks. <coughs> ah, the dream has almost come true. I'm almost out of voice. But um, maybe you, you weren't I to believe, but you're not a Pels member. Well, uh, fortune is shining upon you. There's a code that's out now that I believe is still valid. Um, I, I don't even know if it's supposed to be, but as far as I know, it is. Um, so, if, again, you have to have an existing IEEE membership, but you can add the Pels, which would normally cost you 25 or 26 bucks, um, and have it for free. And at, at best, it, it, it puts you on our list, um, so you hear about all our local events and things like that. Um, senior membership in the IEEE, if you'd like to be elevated to senior membership, um, there's a bunch of junk here about it that I'm not going to go through, but uh, trust me, there are benefits. And uh, the process, some people, um, you know, I, I proclaim it can be pretty, uh, pretty painful, but really the, the, the hardest part is getting three uh, existing sponsors to uh, stand behind you, and that's something we can help you out with. So if you're interested in that, please let us know, and um, we can help you uh, through the process. That's a website. We got it. There it is. Um, I, the eGrid, if you're not aware of this, uh, this is one of the best resources that we have in, in the whole IEEE section here. Um, it, um, it doesn't cost you anything. That's the, the website, you got that biz. If, if you're not already on this, I highly recommend it. It costs you nothing. You throw in your email. They don't use it for any other purpose. Um, twice a month, you get all the events in the area dumped right in your inbox. And you don't even have to be an IEEE member or anything. Um, so if you don't want to join a bunch of lists or a bunch of societies, don't worry about it. You just want to find all the events going on twice a month. Great, great resource. Um, out of respect for our speaker, please take a moment, silence your phones and everything. We uh, don't want to have to uh, publicly shame you. 
Um, but but we will. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for coming. And uh, we're going to try and keep uh, bring bring good stuff for you. So with no further ado, <clears throat> Earl McCune is a fellow of the IEEE, CTO of Aridin Communications, professor of sustainable wireless systems at Delft Technical University in the Netherlands. And uh, hopefully he didn't drive here tonight. Um, and the principal engineer at RF Communications Consulting. He's a graduate of UC Berkeley, Stanford University, and UC Davis for his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in electrical engineering. He's a serial Silicon Valley entrepreneur and has focused much of the past 25 years in getting around the energy efficiency versus circuit linearity trade-off that beguiles the radio communications industry. Um, he's got 91 patents, uh, U.S. And, uh, and many more internationally. Um, he has two textbooks. He's involved in all kinds of IEEE stuff. And, uh, and he's the chair of the IEEE Standards Association uh, Energy Efficient Communication Hardware Working Group. Um, but since he doesn't seem to do anything else with his time, he decided to come and speak to us tonight. And we thank him for that. Welcome, Earl. So this thing's on? Great. Brian, thank you. That's my water, yeah. No, I put this here. And I intend to use it. And thank you, everyone, for sharing some of your evening here. And uh, you know, Brian said, eh, you got to have a con uh, presentation just sitting in your backpack because we have a slot in, in August. And uh, actually, the answer is yes. So um, I'm one of those people that's a member of everything but PELS within the IEEE. Um, I'm a member of Communication Society. Uh, it was MTT that um, put me forward for fellow, I found out, and uh, which, which happened this year. So for that, I'm grateful. I'm uh, a member of IEEE for more than 40 years uh, and still not a life member, damn it. Um, but uh, uh, Brian asked me to talk about something that I've been playing with that's a little unusual, and I am fundamentally an RF guy. I do radios, I do communications, I do signals. What the heck is a guy like me doing in the power business? And it turns out there's a lot of similarities because my fundamental interest, as uh, Brian pointed out, is energy efficiency. How do we actually make the signals that we want, the communication that we need, happen without uh, draining the planet dry? You know, literally, you do that math for 5G, and, uh, and there isn't enough electricity on this planet to run the network as they claim it. And so that's an important thing coming up next month. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to start with a little bit overview of what it is I really do do and um, uh, on, on the switched based radio design because that leads into um, the fact that there's some common physics, a lot of common physics, it's no surprise, Maxwell's equations runs everything, but there's a lot of common circuit structures that actually show up as well. And uh, so it's uh, actually a uh, fairly smooth connection, I think. And from that, um, I've been challenged by a bunch of people who have said, well, all right, you do a lot of switching-based radio circuits. Is there something you can do to help us in the power management world? And uh, they presented me with a couple of problems, and so I've been working on them. And here, I'm going to get to share with you some of those results. Um, I normally like to have questions as they come up. But I don't know if Brian wants to. Thanks, I forgot about that. Yeah, we are recording, so uh, if you can, and let us just, just a quick clarification, please try and hold your questions to the end. So we're okay. going to get through this talk, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Thank okay. you. Okay. Everybody knows that I'm not manageable, but I will follow house rules. <laughs> All right, so talking about what I call zero power idle supply. Um, dimming, very high ratio without flicker flicker drives me crazy. Um, how to get rid of bridge rectifiers and uh, still do power factor correction. So the radio problem is we've had, uh, courtesy of the uh, standards communica uh, stand communications standards, let's get the words in the right order, uh, committees have defined us a bunch of signals that in the last 10 years or so have required linear amplifiers in order to implement them. And so once we do that, we're stuck with the standard stuff here. We've got 
characteristic curves, we have a load line, we have controlled current source, and as we control the current source, we move along that load line and generate our signal. Now, one of the things that I've never seen in a textbook, but I find really important, are these hyperbolae here, right? These are contours of constant power dissipation. And if we're gonna be efficient, you do the math on that and you see that the uh, efficiency is one minus the power dissipation divided by the total DC power coming in. And so you want high efficiency, you must have low power dissipation. So this signal on this load line is near what power control, power dissipation contour? The highest one, right? And so the fundamental problem that we fight in the linear amplifier world and have since the beginning is that choose one. You want good linearity in the circuitry or you want good efficiency. You can't have them both and this is actually a direct artifact of Ohm's law. And so a linear efficient circuit is not possible. All right, so whatever we're trying to do it turns out if you want efficiency, you must have nonlinearity. If you can tolerate nonlinearity, we need different signals. We don't have them, so how are we gonna solve that problem anyway? Um, so what we end up with is um, courtesy of people in uh, societies like Communication Society. Uh, they've designed these wonderful signals with more and more bandwidth efficiency, bits per second per hertz. You know, we only have so many bits, so many hertz available from the regulatory agencies. And uh, as that bit per second hertz is going up, something called the peak to average power ratio is going up, right? And so average power here is somewhere in there. The peak power touches the two ends. And that peak to peak power has to stay in the linear region. Otherwise, that peak, signal peak, where there's an awful lot of information right here and here, if it goes on the other side of that boundary, transistor current goes to zero. That is a nonlinear event, bad thing. If it crosses the other boundary, we head over here where the transistor is no longer a current source. Again, a bad thing. So we have to stay along that boundary. And so we have higher and higher peak to average power ratios, which is what the x-axis is here. And as that happens, the efficiency on the y-axis is dropping. Why is that? Because we're spending more and more of our time in the center of that load line where the power dissipation is highest. Okay, can't get around it. What the consequence of that is, is shown over here, is if I've got a circuit that's got 50% energy efficiency, that means the output I get is half of the total DC I put in so of the total DC that goes in is twice what I really want to come out. The other half stays as power dissipation. We have to get rid of it in a heat sink. So the lower the efficiency goes, the dashed line curve here shows how big the heat sink gets and the solid line shows how big the power supply gets. When efficiency is 40% or so, you know, it's a little still close to two to one ratio. But when we get down below, you know, in the 20s, in the teens and below 10%, the size of the power supply has grown huge for the same output power, and the output power is where you get your range. So we can't negotiate down on that. And we still take out the same amount of power that we had, and then everything else has to go in the heat sink, and we have to pay to make the power and to get rid of the leftovers. So in effect, as the efficiency gets below 20%, we are basically building ourselves in these radios power pumps from the power supply into the heat sink. And that gets extremely expensive. And so the LTE is up here. It's running in the teens, mid-teens. The 5G and R signal uh, communications uh, committees have design something that makes the LTE problem look good. You know, we're below 10% efficiency on these things. And when you do that, you know, the price is just, we don't have the power, we can't afford this network. So this thing coming up next month is really important. 
So what really matters? It's a fundamental question here. If we're going to be building these transmitters, all that really matters is that the output signal is correct. How we get there is up to us. So the modulated signal has to have exactly the same, the correct shape that's required. Normally we do that using linear network theory. We all know that fondly from our junior classes, sophomore classes, or whatever. And um, it definitely, you know, we make our signal big and then we make it larger and larger and bring it up to power using circuit uh, linearity. And linear in this case, I'm using in the mathematical sense. The structure is a transistor control current source just like we had before. Fortunately, physics gives us a second way to have an absolutely precise waveform, and that is through sampling theory. Okay, Nyquist showed way back when, almost, oh God, mid-1920s, so 90 years ago, that if we sample our signal under a certain set of conditions, then we completely keep all the information that we're trying to get. And so, um, however, sampling being time discrete, there's nothing linear about a sampling circuit at all, right? It's a switch. And so that is how we can get around Ohm's law. We're not going to violate Ohm's law, but with the sampling theory, we um, operate, as we will show here, from along the load line and we push ourselves to the edges, endpoints of the load line. And the power dissipation curve contour here is very low value. Up here, it's also much lower value than it is here. That's where the efficiency comes from. The benefit for this is there's no linearity at all. Is that a benefit? Well, if we use it properly according to sampling theory, it is. And so we can actually operate even below the knee voltage of the transistor, which gets us a little bit more power. So there's a lot of benefit. In fact, there's a requirement that if we're going to be efficient, we have to be switching. We've seen that in power supplies, right? And so same thing happens in radios. <clears throat> However, we still need to vary the output signal. You know, how do you control a switch? Well, we got our guidance from the equation, let me just put it here. Whoops, right there. The output voltage is a ratio of the supply over the on resist. Basically, I built ourselves a resistive divider when the thing is on, and that's what sets the current. The independent va va um, variable here is a supply voltage, and so that's what we do. We change the supply voltage the load line stays exactly the same way we have it, but it now intersects different points on the curves, and so the drain current is going to vary as we change the supply, if we've designed this properly. That means that what we have is an output magnitude that depends strictly on the supply plus whatever the load resistance is and the on resistance of the transistor. If the on resistance of the transistor is much, much smaller than the load resistance, anybody who's done a switching power supply, this will sound very familiar, then we don't care about the on resistance of the transistor and everything is controlled by the supply voltage. We have an input of the system, the supply, now completely controlling what our magnitude is. So that by definition is a polar modulation operation, right? We're controlling a polar coordinate magnitude with a third input. Which then reminds us, well, wait a minute, aren't amplifiers two port devices? And the answer is no. They've always been three port devices. We've just made it very convenient for ourselves to say the supply is gonna stay at a fixed value. But if we're gonna head off this way and head toward efficiency, we have to recognize the fact that this thing here is a real three port device and we have to characterize it that way. And we'll talk about that. All right, and my favorite way to do this is what I call the booth surface, which is a, a two-dimensional, two independent variables, the PA supply voltage on this side, RF input power on this side, and the surface then describes what the actual output power is that we get from the amplifier under 
all those conditions taken independently. And what shows up here as Dr. Booth, Rick Booth, and my colleague about 15 years ago pointed out is that there's three clearly different modes on the surface. We have linear mode where the output's independent of the power supply, strongly dependent on the input power. All right, classic class A operation and not dependent. Okay, so the sensitivity here depends on the RF input power and not on the power supply. We have C mode and compression mode where the output power doesn't depend at all on the input power, but it only depends on the power supply. Completely switched around. And then something that's down here called peed mode, which is a place where almost nobody ever wants to operate, but it only exists, as you can see, when the power supply is at very low values. And it turns out to be useful under some situations. And uh, if we're gonna actually do this switching circuit, we'd never ever get on the L mode, we kind of skirt our way around using C mode and P mode. And that works. And the net result is that the efficiency moves from this linear limit up here, based now only on resistive ratios, whatever the load resistance is and our own resistance of the transistor. Um, works much, much better. So from the uh, 5G point of view, we go from less than 10% up to something over 40%. Now we have a chance. Okay. Now, how does this actually work? What, it's, uh, if you do a simulation, you see that the transistor goes from off it goes along the load line, so it dissipates a lot of power halfway up, and then it gets to the other end, and it dissipates a lot less power. So this is the transition along the load line turning on. It stays on for a while, and then to turn it off, we go along the load line back. So we go up to high power and down. And the integral of that is much, much less than anything that a linear amplifier can do. As the frequency goes up, so I have here the ratio of the FT of the transistor to the operating frequency. Then these transitions get closer and closer together and the efficiency ends up dropping because we're not spending much of our time actually in the on resistance. And so this actually is the problem with millimeter waves, which I'm not gonna get into here because you're getting much closer to the FT of the transistors. Um, similarities. We take a look at this amplifier circuit, our transistor, we have an inductive load. We have a capa uh, capacitive coupling to our uh, RF load. Look at that, and then we look at this boost DC-DC circuit. Well, all I do is I change that capacitor with a diode, and we have the same thing. In fact, we learned this the hard way by blowing up several transistors, going, how the heck can we blow this thing up? And it turns out if we weren't controlling the duty cycle on the input very well. And so we ended up having it on for a long amount of time. And so for the brief amount of time it was off, there was a lot of energy in that inductor and bing, and poof. And so, like I say, very important to carefully manage this. But it just shows there is an immediate connection circuit-wise between what we do in the radio world and what is done in at least part of the power management world. And so that leads into now switching supplies. First thing, switching supplies are not voltage sources, right? Because the basic controlling element here is that inductor current. And for this thing to be stable, that inductor current has to match the load current. Any differences have to come, either go into or come out of that capacitor. So this capacitor is setting how good the regulation is the inductor is setting how much current you're actually getting, and both of these have energy stored in them. All right, and so we have one half Li squared up here, one half CV squared in the capacitor. And this uh, switching controller here has to work to make sure that the inductor current and the load current do match eventually. If it doesn't, then there will be a lack of, reg whoops, lack of regulation. So if I want to change the voltage out of a switching supply, 
I have to change the energy that's stored in both the inductor and in the capacitor, right? And so uh, if I want to go, for example, from voltage one to voltage two, then the change in energy is the change in the inductor uh, energy and the change plus the change in the capacitor energy. You do all the substitutions, you find out a couple things. One, the amount of energy change depends on what the average of the two is. And so changing 100 millivolts at two volts takes more energy than changing 100 millivolts at one volt. Okay, that's like, we see that in our automobiles, going from 60 to 70 miles an hour is a lot harder than going from zero to 10. All right, same physics. If we want to change that voltage in a very short amount of time, which we need to in uh, digital processors, for example, then we divide all this by our time step. Same thing, divided by the time step. If this time step goes towards zero, then the amount of you know, energy joules per second, that's watts, we can end up with transient powers very easily in the kilowatts range. But we don't have that kind of energy in most switching power supplies, and therefore they have to be slow. So switching, a uh, voltage switch in a switching supply, um, if we're gonna do it quickly, or in any supply actually, um, we have to provide some power to do that. And uh, the net result is we have supply agility that's much, much slower than the operating speeds of the logic. And in modern stuff, it's almost six orders of magnitude, somewhere between five and six orders of magnitude difference between the two. And so that sets a lot about how one is able to control digital things. So how might an RF engineer approach this problem? Because what we really want is to have our operating voltage if at some point the system goes idle, and why we care here I show from my uh, laptop computer when I was doing the presentation, system is idle 96% of the time. So if I'm idle, why should I be drawing power? Right, well, the problem is that this idle thing is a little narrow spike, and um, the power supply is not fast enough to follow that, and so they keep the power supply on, the thing runs no up operations. So we can get this transition to be 10 nanoseconds down and then 10 nanoseconds back up. Now we're operating at logic speeds. And any time that the processor is not doing anything, or logic circuit in general, doesn't have to be a processor, then it can draw zero power. This leads to power proportional computing. How can we do this? And because you know, if we're gonna change the voltage that fast, we have to have a lot of power, right? And the answer is no, because we can keep the energy in the tank. We just disconnect it with a very fast high power switch, which is exactly what I've been using in my radio transmitters. And so that type of circuitry makes a lot of sense. At the same time, this inductor current has to hold, and so we have to put a switch across that to loop the current around. And we just hold the energy in the network for as ever long as we need during this off period. And then when it's time to bring it back up, we open that switch, close that switch, and turn this on, and off we go. And just operate that way. And um, how well does that work? Yeah, this, by the way, is 10 amps per box here. So that's 17 amperes in 10 nanoseconds. No transient. Uh, damping thing up here because there's no control system. It's the capacitor voltage. We disconnect the capacitor, the load brings it down. Reconnect the capacitor, the capacitor brings it back up. Done. Okay. So specifically, here's the structure. When it's normally running, we have our uh, synchronous rectifier, put a switch there, open that switch, close this switch, everything runs fine. We want to hold things, we keep this off so no current comes from the source, loop the inductor current, open up the capacitor, and then the load pulls that down very quickly. And uh, that works for switchers, it also works for linear regulators, and, uh, 
and off we go. So what ends up happening as you change the duty cycle, we look at the average of the input current, it goes from, in this case, two amperes, all the way down with a very, very straight line down to whatever the bias currents is that are stable uh, to make the system run. And so the amount of actual activity governs now what goes on in how much power is drawn by the system. So if we're running 96% efficiency, we can save 96% of the power. Well, it's not quite 96, it's more like 93. But that's okay. The rest of that stays in the battery. That's a good thing. Or if our system is running at 30% efficiency, like most servers are, 30% busy, then you save a lot of power. And for the uh, vernacular of the uh, uh, processor uh, power control people, mode C0 is on, mode C2 and C3 are off, and the transition between the two is something that often is described as being friction as we move from one state to another. We want to make sure that friction is very low, and this actually achieves that. A little more detail here, leaving it in a very, very low duty cycle. I'm not doing much, I'm doing an audio thing. Why do I, can't I just lower the voltage? He says, well, you don't really don't want to, because all during this time, you're drawing absolutely nothing, not dissipating any power, no heat. You turn the thing on, turn it off. Here's that little pulse zoomed in. And here we see the 10 nanosecond rise, the capacitor holding while the switcher kicks back in and then the switcher does its thing. And then when we're done, just shut everything off, open the switches and be done. Very quick. All right, and I happen to bring the prototype here. People wanna see it. Uh, one of the problems near and dear to my personal heart, which is why it gives me a lot of motivation, is flicker drives me nuts. If I'm driving out and you know I'm scanning my eyes across the road and I see pop, 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 pop from uh, PWM dimming of brake lights or nowadays even on some headlights and, and running lights, um, I go crazy. And so the question is, is there some way to solve this problem? While still getting a lot of, uh, of control? And the answer is, Yes, and the various ranges here from uh, shunt switch pulse width modulation, which is used in some automotive stuff, general PWM, linear regulators, sense resistors, all of these have usually about 100 to 1 dimming ratios. These two, of course, are uh, where most of that, that flicker comes from. So another one that uh, strikes me as, as useful and went ahead and built it, which is variable resistance, which is basically this feedback system here you build a resistor here and you regulate a voltage across it that's really small, under 50 millivolts. And then you vary that resistor and then this whole system works well. And because this voltage is much, much less than the voltage across the LEDs, the net efficiency of this control system is the ratio of the voltage across the LED of this voltage uh, Yeah, so the voltage across the LEDs divided by the voltage across the entire stack. Let's get the math right. And that can be awfully close to one. And I have some of those too. These LEDs are on actually. We're on. That's why you have a backup. Very bright. The point, being. the point being that very easily, you know, those are still on. Controlling 30,000 to one with low cost and absolutely no flicker. And the control efficiency is over 90, you know, 99%. The only reason this one 
is less is because the voltage across the LEDs is low. And so this is actually being used in a bunch of horticultural applications right now because of that. All right. Another thing that in my quest of being efficient, I take a look at these bridge rectifiers and I'm going, mm, all right, voltage is always across the diodes in the forward row. Is there another way to do this? Can we take all three functions here, the bridge, the power factor correction, and the DC-DC converter that controls something, in this case, the figure shows LEDs, and uh, pull that together into something that's gonna be more efficient and, uh, and behave a whole lot better? And the answer is, as far as I can tell, yes, because this seems to work well. The answer to me comes from the fact that a recognition that the power line is not a differential signal, which is what a bridge rectifier really requires. And so putting a bridge reflector across the non-balanced signal, you can make it work, but you gotta be real careful about how you're going to um, uh, test the, the thing. You're not gonna put your scope probe ground here. Um, so when the voltage on the line is above, get the buttons right. On the positive side of you, so this is the neutral, this is the line. You run, you want to run a DC-DC converter in its normal road. If it's negative, then you use a DC-DC converter in its inverted form. The direction of the current in the inductor is the same. And so the voltage that comes out of the thing is the same. And so we actually do rectification and voltage conversion at the same time with the same circuit and don't need the forward losses that we have in a normal diode here because these are switches. Now, what else can happen here? Well, one thing is it's one inductor. We can put four switches around that. It kind of looks sort of bridgey like even though they aren't really. Um, and with one inductor handle the fact that the input signal here about line and neutral is going up and down and this stays fixed based on a control table over there. And um, when we run these uh, switches here at what I would call a nominal frequency, which would be 10 megahertz or higher, which we can do very easily with the gallium nitride transistors, um, then what ends up happening is the EMI filtering, which is has to sit up front here, is greatly reduced, which is a big deal for reducing costs, lowering costs. The other thing is a recognition that it's the duty cycle of the switch control that sets the voltage control ratio between what's going in and what's coming out. But it's the frequency that sets the effective input impedance. If the frequency gets a lot higher, since we're charging this inductor so we have a particular current ramp time. If we don't let the thing ramp up very far, we're not gonna get a lot of average current. And so it effectively improves, increases the input impedance. So we can control the input impedance presented here simply by not changing the duty cycle, but by changing the frequency. And what this shows here, here's the effective input resistance as it goes from a couple of ohms up to over a K ohm. As the frequency goes from megahertz, 10 megahertz, to a couple hundred, uh, 100 megahertz, we're probably not gonna run it quite that far, but uh, the principle still holds as long as the switches are fast enough. And the switch being fast enough depends uh, on exactly the same physics that we used in the uh, switching power amplifier. We have to have a ratio between the switching frequency and the FT of the transistor that's high enough in the thousand range which is exactly where switching power supplies work right now. Why isn't the average current constant? What, between these two cases? No, between the input and the load. Oh, it is. Well, but you said the frequency changed the average current. If you change... You said the inductor current, average current changed the frequency. Mm -hmm. Other variable here is that what the value of the input voltage is, right? So if you want to hold a, a constant resistance here. I want to hold a constant current to the load. 
Okay, and in which case you have to match that, change this frequency a bit against what the voltage is as it's varying in order to do that. Or change the duty cycle, which is what is done now. If I change the duty cycle, why would the current and the why? I'll ask afterwards. That's fine. Okay. Is the in, sorry, I have one quick question. Is the inductor in that circuit the 2F line hold up or is it that capacitor? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question again. I'm an RF guy, so... I... Uh, when the line power goes to zero, where's all the energy coming from that's going to the... Oh, well, that would be later on. Right. That has to be out here. Okay. So it's it is cap. Yeah, that. The cap around the load. Okay, and so uh, this actually brings me into, uh, we're about ready to go for questions anyway. Uh, the important thing is a recognition that even, you know, radio world and the power management world does share the same physics. And so uh, what we do, you know, working in one does apply to the other, though um, in the RF world where we're naturally working in gigahertz rates, the, dealing with very, very higher frequencies is something that is, is more uh, familiar, even though we may not use tens of amperes, and so there's plenty of good uh, cross-communication that we want to do to get this done. Um, and there are three, uh, three things that I've at least played with. There may be plenty more, of course, and um, I'm willing to come here and talk with the power community and see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and see if we can improve things for everybody. And with that, thank you. All right, well, uh, we have some time for Q&A. Uh, sound like we already had some Q. So, uh, a, but <laughs> and I got a uh, mic to pass around. Make sure any that uh, we don't have any redundancy. Oh. Anyone, anyone? We were on this side. You... Uh, when you were talking about uh, the uh, the whatever mixed PFC circuit thing, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that. So just from looking at it, I, I may be wrong, but it looks like the the main switches are hard switched, right? Uh, not resonantly switched, so they're hard transitions. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that you thought you could do, you know, GAN to, you know, 10 megahertz or something off the line. Um, the, I, I'm not sure um, how to get efficiency in that scenario. Uh, the overlap losses tend to be substantial. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, I guess what I'm asking is, like, have you tested that? I have tested it to a, to a degree, right? Just to make, make sure that the functioning works. Have I wrung it out into a super design? No. Okay. Okay, because I'm not really qualified to do that. Um, I would hope that can work with other people here who are. And having two different backgrounds approaching the same problem have something that comes out hopefully that's better than either one individually. One of the things I've learned in running companies over the last 30 some odd years is that you know, innovation is best when I make sure that people on the team all come from very, very different backgrounds. And then I insist that the people get along and if they don't, we'll put somebody else who does, right? Because these different backgrounds have to be respected. And uh, everybody's gonna ask different questions. You know, I've seen this over and over, you know, dozens and dozens of times. And, and it really works well. And so that would be the kind of thing, so, oh, let's try this structure and see what happens. Um, do I fully understand it? No, right? Um, that's not my background. Working with somebody who would understand that type of thing, but the fact that running at 100 megahertz to me is DC. Yeah. Okay, so 10 megahertz is 
below DC. <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of All years right, so uh, trying to get trying to get papers into the into into TPELs. They were running at 100 megahertz, and people were always highly skeptical. But it does work. <laughs> no, it does work absolutely. You know, I do it at gigahertz. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. I think uh, was it Payne that was in a question before. Okay. Perhaps I misunderstood what you said. Okay. But let's go back to your slide that showed the load in the AC. That one Whoop. back. Okay. I am. Now I understood you to say that if you change the free switching frequency, you would change the average current in the inductor. If the load is constant and I want a constant V out and the V in is constant, then the current through the inductor has to be constant. And the therefore, average current has to be constant, right. no matter what the frequency is. Now you will change the peak to peak current if you change the frequency, but I don't see why you change the average current. But the frequency impacts what the value of the inductor is. And so if you fix the value of the inductor, you've also fixed the frequency if you want to hold that current still. So if we're going to change the frequency, I've got to change the inductor to go with it. I've got to make the inductor smaller. That's the whole point of going to higher frequency and switching converters, right? No, As I, I thought you were saying it. the important the value of going to higher frequency was to change the impedance. If the inductor is fixed, that happens, okay? And if I'm not understanding the question, we'll have plenty. I look forward to talking. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a good simplification of, uh, I guess, an AC bridgeless circuit. But, mm -hmm. you know, it makes it a little easier if you point out which ones are switching at the 60 hertz rates and which ones are going to be switching at the high frequency rate. It's all switching at high frequency. They don't have to be a lot of times. They don't have to, but where I'm coming from, they do, right? But a right, lot right, of cases two you DC use, converters. Two, you know, uh, uh, two really conventional FETs switching at, so you're switching between a boost and a buck here, kind of, no. right? Um, switching between an inverting and uh, a non-inverting, inverting but they're both bucks. Inverting one. An inverting buck and a non-inverting buck, depending on what the input voltage is compared to what the output voltage is. And so, because I thought that was a point here, is some of them are switching at different frequencies. You're varying the duty cycle as you go up and down the incoming right. so, line. Right. Which so, is kind of varying your impedance. Yeah, so the point saying. here is it operates two of the switches this way, standard synchronous rectifier, LC. Whenever the voltage is above zero, voltage below zero, then switches in this arrangement. So just, yeah, inverting. Switch in. So these are all running when they're running at high frequency. So it complicates it. You say if the voltage is greater than, is positive, then these two switches are running fast, and the other two switches are fixed. And then when the voltage flips, these voltage flips, the, the, the first two fix, and then the other switch at frequency. All of it up at HF. Have you done any uh, two-tone intermod tests uh, at different frequencies to see how linear your switching system is for the radio yeah so for, so, for the so what supplies, so why what kind, I do like that? for example if for for a linear amplifier if you mm -hmm. put in uh, two adjacent signals what's the third order look like how many db down is it for a two depends on how much control you have over the envelope the uh, control that uh, current hardware has right now is 80 db 80 that's 80 db that's outstanding how and high can you go up in frequency with uh, four and a half gigahertz. That's good. And uh, so the third order intermods are 50, 60 dB down. down. They're done, you said 80 or 60? 50 or 60 dB down. Oh, 50 to 60. Yeah. Okay. That's what I wanted to know, that number. Well, that's, that's great. Yeah. And that's what like I say, if, you, if it's a real switching system, all the information is there. You should have some slides showing those things. Uh, if you come in September, okay. you know, this presentation was not about that, but the one that's coming up in September in this uh, sure. event that uh, Brian's putting together is focusing on this. Okay. And so that'll be in there. Thanks. Ooh, good commercial. I like that. Um, <laughs> Anos? 
Are you stretching or raising your hand or? <laughs> okay. Well, if it if it goes from internal inquisitiveness to external, you let me know, and we'll get you a mic. Yeah. Over there. Welcome. <clears throat> Yes, I'm an RF guy too, and I design gall gallium nitride amplifiers and so on. Mm -hmm. And knowing the uh, com little bit complex nature of the timing of the gate versus the drains, and you've got to make sure that the gate comes up before the drains and all this kind of thing, otherwise you get some kind of runaway. Are there some special, I guess the controller does some kind of special control in that regards as well, right? Yeah, that's magic in the driver. Yeah, just like we have in uh, the radios, there's making the high-speed switching stuff work in the gigahertz range, there's a lot of magic in the drivers. There will be something very similar here. Mm. Sounds very tricky, though, these kind of rates, you know, keeping the gates that's why we get the biased correctly. And that's why we get the big bucks, right? <laughs> Figure that out. Right. All right, good. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Yeah, the problem exists. How do we deal with it? That's up to us. Forty-five percent. Yep. Anyone else? That's modulated. Anyone else? No, nope. still stretching. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, there oh. we go. <laughs> Ha -ha. We chase it. Yes, um, um, I love the comment actually about cross-pollination of different domains. It's always extremely powerful. And a lot of things come to mind, like Bob Carver did similar things as Digital Power from Alan Shapui. A lot of stuff has been done in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, when we push the envelope further, where do you see the highest challenge? I've seen some parasitic issues on the left side that could really bite us in the butt. I see some control loop stability issues there. Uh, where do you think is the biggest challenge that you would advise to spend time on to solve? Well, where are the challenges? Um, Which issues have you come across yeah, when well, building it? Parasitics. Are, if you're going into high frequency, parasitics are the big deal. You know, Understand what the circuit really is, and it's almost never what it is you've drawn. Right, there's energy storage here and there, these are capacitances, there's inductances everywhere, and you have to account for them all. Right, that's what you do in, in the RF side. Um, from a technology point of view, the biggest problem I normally on, in, oops, sorry, um, during uh, the normal development of these radios, we're fighting is the FT at power the extrinsic FT of the transistor in C2 because that controls how fast it switches from one side to the other. Now that problem will also exist in any kind of switching converter because we have to transition between on and on in a minimum amount of time. Now, other things that show up, of course, are the DIDTs that come along with that, coupling across and generating other issues. All of this comes out of Maxwell's equations. Right, and so um, those people who think that power supplies are low frequency, just like people who thought that clocking processors at a gigahertz was no big deal because it's, there's a wire, it's connected, what's the big deal? It's kind of, mm -hmm. no. Um, keep in mind, the physics still rules. And the higher and higher in frequency we go, the more the physics we're exposed to. And therefore, the more of it we need to understand in order to make sure that we solve the problems properly. It's good guidance. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> He's giving it to you on the other side. How is high voltage eliminated in this? Uh, everything bucks. It does not go to a boost. That high voltage? Um, most of the PFCs that I've seen go to above line voltage and then have to come back down. You don't consider 160 volts or 240 volts high voltage? Yeah, that's a lot higher than five. Uh, I think but the official the volts official going in. What? You've got 260 volts going in. Are you asking if it's an isolated supplier? 
No, I'm asking where. I'm asking how high voltage is eliminated. I see transistors switching hundreds and volts. Volts. Yes. All right. The system is not going to a higher voltage than the line as an intermediate step. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. If I did an OSHA definition of high voltage, that's 50 volts. Of course. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry, what was that last time? The OSHA definition of high voltage. Occupational safety and health. I know what OSHA stands for. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry. I wasn't sure. Okay, so we have that's 50. Peak voltage at least 160 volts. That would be a high voltage. Fine, yes, that's true. So, so maybe you can explain which markets use a non-isolated high voltage converter. LEDs. Yeah, this is really common for LEDs. 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 LED light bulbs where you can't touch the LED. Yep. All right. So I'll repeat the question. If you would <laughs> which applications were for the non-isolated yeah. high voltage DC DC yeah. a light bulb where everything's contained everything's mm -hmm. isolated by where plastic. you can't yeah you can't access oh, man, it. I hate people who answer their own questions. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? See, it's right. a good thing you left so much Q and A time. That's okay. Well, and we have still a fair amount of time before they're going to throw us out. That's right. Okay, anybody wants to talk afterwards, that's fine. And uh, really appreciate your time. All right, well, let's, uh, thank let's thank her one more time. Thank you. Kev? And as a uh, token of our appreciation, <laughs> and as you can thank see, you. this is so valuable, people will come back after two years just to get it. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brian. Well, All right. Official. And uh, but hopefully, like Tony, you don't have to have that bare spot on your wall <laughs> just sitting there blank for all those years. It's just... Longing, staring at it every day. <laughs> but, uh, all right, folks.